Good morning, and welcome to everyone joining us for worship this morning. Starting next week, we will begin in-person worship in the sanctuary. For the first few weeks, there will be just one service at 9.30 so that we can have Andy here with us to set up all the streaming technology. So even if you can't be with us here in person, you will be able to join us on your electronic device. By August, we hope to have both of our Sunday services going, and by September, we will have Sunday morning edu education classes as well. Psalm 103 says, God forgives and heals us. God surrounds us with love that never quits. Let us worship God who loves, forgives, and heals us. Gracious God, we hear you calling. You have shown us hope and you offer us courage. We come to you as people who long to walk your pathways of grace and love. But many times, God, we get discouraged by our living. We are afraid of the difficult experiences. We despair at challenges that are given to us. We are afraid that what we do is not enough and will not make any difference. Lord, help us to know that your love is always there, sustaining us and surrounding us with care. Take our insecurities, our doubts, our feeble attempts at discipleship, and transform us to be your new people, knowing that everything we do, no matter how big or small, is work for your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Friends, Know that whoever trusts in God will not be disappointed. Whoever reaches out to others in the spirit of Christ will know the joy of God's love. You are forgiven. You are loved. Share these gifts. Amen.
can't seem to get this thing to work. How am I supposed to go to church on this uh, YouTuber thing? And what is a YouTube? Is, is it somewhere on my computer? I, I can't see any tubes coming out of it. Is this supposed to be the worship service? It looks like some new kind of liturgical dance. I, mean, I, I don't understand a single word they're saying. But maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, Mr. Methuselah. Mr. Methuselah. Uh, oh, what? Who is that? Are you on my computer? No, Mr. Methuselah. It's me, Pastor Gene. I came here to tell you that you don't have to watch worship on your computer anymore. Oh, well, that's good. I can't see anything on it now. Well, starting next week, you can come to the sanctuary for worship. Oh, huh. is that where I can find this, this YouTube thing? No, Mr. Methuselah. It's not on YouTube. Uh, is it on the waste book thing? Um, that's Facebook. Oh, seems like a waste of time to me. <laughs> no, Mr. Methuselah, it's going to be real people all together in the sanctuary. What? We're starting in-person worship next week. You can come to church and worship there. What, with other people? Well, yes. All over the place? Yes, we'll all be there with you. That sounds terrible. Oh, but I thought that... Uh, who wants to be around a bunch of people? They're always causing a fuss. Don't like being around people. Someone's always causing trouble. But Mr. Methuselah... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Looks looks like it's working now. Oh. Um, Mr. Methuselah, I, I don't think... Oh, this is the good part. Uh, let me watch. Oh, well, okay, Mr. Methuselah. I'll leave you to this. But just remember, you're always welcome to come to church. I know we're not perfect people, but we'd love it if you would join us. Worship is so much better when we can all be together. Oh my, it looks like he's fallen asleep. Well, I hope he joins us for worship next week. I guess we'll just have to find out then. As we said earlier, next Sunday, we're gonna resume in-person worship services. So we'll no longer worship like we are today, like we have for most of the last year. We will live stream next week's service, which means you can watch the in-person service at home on your computer or phone, but we will no longer do this. You may not know that even though we post this service on YouTube and Facebook on Sunday mornings at 9.30, we actually record it on Thursday or Friday, and then on Saturday, Andy edits the whole service into the final version that comes out on Sunday morning. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes that you probably don't know when you watch it on Sunday morning. While one of us is talking, usually Andy is recording on one of two cameras that we have in the room. And while we're presenting the sermon or liturgy, the musicians are, are oh, oh, you probably shouldn't have seen that. Sometimes when it seems like we're jumping from place to place in the church, it happens because we record different parts of the service separately and then edit them together into the final service. And even though it might not always seem like it, everything that happens in worship is worked out ahead of time at our weekly planning meeting that usually takes place on Tuesday afternoons. And there are lots of other people who work behind the scenes to make our worship service happen. Steve, our church custodian, helps set up the room and Crystal keeps us organized and all of you up to date about what we're doing. And most weeks, in addition to the usual musicians, there are others who have recorded music that we use in the service. Once a month, Rick plays the organ, Barbara leads the bell ringers, other church members have done solos or bigger ensembles, and lots of special guest musicians have come and helped us or sent videos. And all of these people not only take the time to rehearse this music, but to come down here to the church and record it ahead of time.
And many of you have participated in the service by providing flowers, sending in a recording of passing of the peace, or your children waving palm branches. And of course, even before the pandemic, there were always lots of things going on behind the scenes. Ushers and greeters welcoming people into the building, church school teachers, children's caregivers, musicians and liturgists, sound and projection helpers, not to mention plumbers, electricians, and heating and cooling technicians who make sure that we can all see and hear and be comfortable in this place. And while we're thinking of all the things that go on behind the scenes here at church, it might be a good time to think about some of the behind the scene characters in the Bible. Characters that barely get mentioned, but provide some important bit of help at a crucial moment like Rahab, who lived in the city of Jericho. And when she discovered a couple of Israelites who were spying on the city, she helped them escape from the authorities. Or how about the four friends of the paralyzed man who dig a hole in the roof of a house in order to lower the man down by ropes to Jesus? And you probably know who Moses was. You recognize the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what about Shipra and Pua? Those are the names of a couple of midwives who in the first chapter of Exodus are commanded by the king of Egypt to kill all the male Hebrew babies. But they refuse to do it. And when Pharaoh accuses them of disobeying his orders, they lie telling him that the Hebrew women have such a short labor period that they give birth before they can even arrive. My new favorite behind the scenes Bible character is one that I never noticed despite being very familiar with the story. He only came to light for me while listening to an Arlo Guthrie concert and he mentioned this obscure biblical character. I still didn't believe that he existed so I looked it up and sure enough there he was right in the middle of the story of Joseph. You know the story of Joseph, one of Jacob's 12 sons, his favorite son, the one with a coat of many colors. So at the beginning of the story, the other 11 brothers are out in the fields taking care of the sheep while Joseph is relaxing back at the house until Jacob says to his son, Joseph, why don't you go check on your brothers and see how they're doing and then come back here and give me a report. So Joseph heads out to look for his brothers. Now, Jacob must have owned a lot of land because his brothers are nowhere to be seen and Joseph can't find them anywhere. And then in Genesis 37 verse 15, it says, and a man found Joseph wandering in the fields and said to him, what are you looking for? And Joseph said, I'm looking for my brothers. And the man said, they went that way. That's it. That's all this guy does in the entire Bible. Joseph asks him where his brothers are. And the man says, they went that way. But if that guy had not done that one thing, Joseph might have never found his brothers on that day, and then his brothers might not have tried to kill him, which I realize might not have been a bad thing. But then Joseph wouldn't have been sold as a slave to an Egyptian, and then he wouldn't have been put in an Egyptian prison, and then he wouldn't have gotten out and interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, and then he wouldn't have been in charge of storing grain to save Egypt from the drought, and then Joseph's brothers wouldn't have traveled to Egypt to buy some of the grain, and they wouldn't have reunited and forgiven each other, and they wouldn't have moved the whole family to Egypt, and they wouldn't have eventually become slaves of the next Pharaoh, which again, would not have been such a bad thing. But then we'd have never had Moses, and the escape from Egypt, and the journey through the wilderness, and the Ten Commandments, and the Promised Land, and none of that would have happened if one guy hadn't said to Joseph, your brothers went that way. Sometimes we're called by God to be the main person on some new mission or the leader of a 
movement, to be a Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. And sometimes we're called by God to be the person who works behind the scenes. Sometimes all we're called to do is to point and say, they went that way. It's all important work. Nothing and no one is insignificant. We all matter. In one of the churches where Jean and I served, there was one guy who every Sunday would stand at the front door of the church and open them for people as they came in. He didn't serve on the session, he wasn't on a committee, he didn't go on mission trips, but every Sunday, whether it was in the heat of the summer or on a cold, snowy winter day, he would open the door for people. And these doors were the original 100-year-old, massive, 10-foot-tall mahogany doors that were not easy to open, especially if there was any kind of wind. And so this guy did the one thing he felt called to do, open the door. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm encouraging you to do the least possible thing you can do for God. But I do want to say, that no action, no matter how small, is insignificant. And sometimes we never know what kind of impact we have on another person. Reinhold Niebuhr once said, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime, therefore we must be saved by hope. Nothing true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history, therefore we must be saved by faith. And nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone, therefore we are saved by love. Maybe from our own limited point of view, everything we do appears to be behind the scenes, unnoticed by most of the world. But we must believe that each one of us plays a part in God's greater purposes. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do in this life, know that it matters. Thanks be to God.
1967 in our Presbyterian Book of Confessions says this. We go into the world to serve God wherever we are, at work or at play, in private or with others. Our daily actions in the world represent the church's mission to the world. Each of us is given by the Spirit some gift of ministry and is responsible for the integrity of our witness in our own particular situation. Please join with me in a responsive pastoral prayer taken from a book of prayers called Bread of Tomorrow, Praying for the World's Poor, edited by Janet Morley. O oh God, the source of our common life, when we are dry and scattered, when we are divided and alone, we long for connection, we long for community. Breath of God, breathe on us with those we live beside who are often strange to us, whom we may be afraid to approach, yet who have riches of friendship to share. We, we long, long for, for connection. connection. We, we long, long for community. community. Breath of God, breathe on us. With those we have only heard of, who see with different eyes, whose struggles we try to imagine, whose fierce joy we wish we could grasp. We long for connection. We long for community. Breath of God, breathe on us. With those we shall never know, but whose lives are linked to ours, whose shared ground we stand on, and whose common air we breathe. We long for connection. We long for community. Breath of God, Breathe on us. When we are dry and scattered, when we are divided and alone, when we are cut off from the source of our life, open our graves, O God, that all your people may be free to breathe, strong to move, 
and joyful to stand together to celebrate your name. We long for connection. We long for community. Breath of God, breathe on us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught all his followers to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and always.